Let me just repeat the welcome to everybody this morning here in the room and, and across the globe. It's my great pleasure to chair this morning's session, and if you look at the program, you'll see that uh, physicists believe in symmetry. We've got a nice symmetry of two, uh, two people on the podium from Birmingham and two from Berlin. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Mark Dennis from the University of Birmingham, which is also my institution, who will be talking uh, about the classical light and its properties to us this morning. Uh, I've been told, and I'll just uh, address that to the speakers, that we have to be very strict on timing to keep to, to our schedule. So the format is 30 minutes presentations, then 15 minutes for question and answers, for which I'll join the uh, presenters on the podium. And there'll be roving microphones for anybody who wants to ask questions from within the room. So uh, if you indicate your intention to ask a question, if you could just raise your hand and wait for the microphone to reach you so that people uh, who are following us through the stream can actually hear the questions uh, as well as the answers. So, Mark, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Yes, yes. Great, thank you. So, um, so as I understand it, what I'm going to be trying to um, talk about to you today is introducing you to the topic of light, in particular seen through the lens of um, the history, particularly focusing in my talk on what we call classical light. Now, different people, I guess, depending upon your background, uh, you might have a different interpretation of what classical is. If you're a research physicist, probably classical is anything before 1900. And if you're an ancient historian, classical is anything before um, um, 100 BC or something. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and, and, and focus in a particular period that I think is very interesting that um, are, um, in the 1600s where we have, which is what we would think of as the dawn of modern physics, and think about how the science of light arose in parallel with other sorts of sciences, but also picking up where some of those ideas that were being discussed 300 and so years ago um, show up a little bit in modern physics. So um, apologies to Keats, I'm unweaving the rainbow in the sense of trying to make sense of all of the various different um, of historical facts as, um, as a physicist. So when we say, how should we think of optics, as in many areas of physics, we say, well, why don't we start with Isaac Newton? And when we think of Newton, we think of um, um, uh, some, some, something like this. This, this, is, this is him in 1687, when his famous um, Principles of Natural Philosophy was published, which, from our physics point of view, is the laws of mechanics. That's Newton's three laws. It's the laws of astronomy and planets and so forth. It's mathematically, he derives everything mathematically from his three laws with a logical structure following the ancient Greek mathematicians. But when we talk about optics, we're actually thinking of this Newton some a few decades later. So the optics, well, this is describing his experiments over the course of his life but was published in 1704, so, um, so sometime after his mechanics. And it's really, if you look at it, although he talks about axioms and proofs, it's really a collection of empirical phenomena. And so it's highly synthetic. It's based on, of course, when we talk about optics, we're talking about stuff we see. And there's not necessarily any logical structure behind the various different sorts of phenomena that we see with our eyes. So when we think about optics, we have to be careful what is it that we mean. So when we think of optics, we can't separate it from the physiology of human vision because it's what we see. So in particular, for example, what we, we know, of course, that we're talking about the electric, full electromagnetic spectrum that has length scales from um, fractions of, of the size of an atom all the way to um, giant um, you know, kilometers and longer. And there's this tiny little band which we call optics because our eyes happen to be particularly sensitive in that frequency range because it happens that that's the maximum emission from the sun. 
So these are all, from a sort of physics point of view, coincidences, but yet we still say optics is the behavior of electromagnetism in that range. When we look about the history of optics, though, because seeing is such a fundamental um, sense for us, of course, we want to make images all the time, and images are, and, and our imaging systems, our imaging technology, are absolutely central to the science of optics. So we can't separate the abstract science, like we might try with mechanics, from optics technology. So thinking about imaging, we're thinking about lenses, telescopes, microscopes, and so on. So lenses, just to put it into some context, there's evidence, here's a medieval manuscript, and you can see these monks singing away, and this fellow's got some glasses on. So lenses go back to the 1200s. Um, telescopes and microscopes, evidence is they were both developed around 1605 in the Netherlands as, um, as, as sort of technological things that were immediately picked up in science. So Galileo, as soon as he got a telescope, he looks up, and this is his sketch of the moon. And Kepler, shortly afterwards, with a refinement on Galileo's telescope design. And... 50 years afterwards, Robert Hooke, whose building is just across the way, with his development of what looking at various things in microscopes, and his is his famous image of a flea. So, so alongside the development in the science, and I'll focus on the science, we've got the technology always um, um, slightly behind. And because these are so important for astronomy or understanding biology, we often think of optical science taking a supporting role in other sciences. So here I've got astronomy and biomedical. And of course, that's still the case today. So I was thinking, so trying to think of some themes of classical optics, and obviously the rainbow is going to be coming up at some point. So I've tried to think that these are five themes that I picked out. This is, this is just me thinking of, of particular themes that that come up in, that say, starting in the early 1600s, um, Newton discusses all of them at some level, and they all play a role in uh, modern optics as well. So thinking about rays and geometrical optics, mechanical effects of light, waves and physical optics, color and polarization. And this is just a bit, this is a bit lighthearted, really. I was trying to think of the various sorts of well, the people that I'm highlighting today, so thinking about, we mentioned Kepler and Galileo, um, Descartes, six, no, 1630s, and then, remarkably, in a window of less than 20 years, beginning with Fermat in 1662 and finishing with Hawkins in 1678, all of these observations are, or, or observations or theories that are fundamental to modern optics that are before Newton. This was the same period that Newton was working on his mechanics, and he did an optics experiments as well, but his book, his book was a few decades afterwards. And then major uh, further developments, Thomas Young in the early 1800s, um, and then following all the way to Maxwell in the 1860s with his electromagnetic theory of light. And I'm not gonna, but I will focus on the, the sort of these developments and the sort of color coded to the themes that I picked before. So I'm starting then with rays and geometrical optics, which is where everybody starts. And I can see Tom McLeish in the front row, and he will no doubt want to point out the very detailed arguments of, of how ray physics started with the Greeks and passed through Arabs, uh, Arabic science. I instead want to just think of something a lot less sophisticated. And again, I'm thinking from a physics point of view, on the history point of view. So I borrowed my daughter's book, Optical Physics for Babies, which says that light travels in a straight line until it hits something. So that's a good start so for what we talk all about ray theory. And of course, it under, the fact that light travels in a straight line underpins our whole idea of, of, of light, what we see, but how we picture it in our minds through geometry. So in fact, the idea of light rays goes back to antiquity, and the name that's often associated with that is Euclid, the same as the person who wrote the book on geometry. 
Um, but importantly, um, Al Haitam um, 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 in when was it about 1100 um, was made the important observation that the arrow points away from the light source and into our eye, because before that people thought that the light rays came out of our eyes and to the things that we saw. And there was sort of a lot of confusion about that. But I say, I'm that, I was treating this, as far as this course talk goes, as ancient history. So I'm sort of starting with, well, 1604, Kepler's um, book. So Kepler, obviously, very famous astronomer, Three Laws of Planetary Motion. And he wrote a book, The Optical Part of Astronomy, which is different from the mechanical part, just like Newton talks about. And his optical part of astronomy, he talks, for example, about light going in straight lines, the law of specular reflection that's also ascribed to Euclid, that is to say angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. He talks about refraction from the atmosphere, but he didn't write down the famous Snell's law that relates the sign of the angle with the normal um, to the refractive index of the material. That was 1621, so I guess, Joe, if you're looking for historical link for this meeting, it's um, the 400th anniversary of Snell's Law of Discovery. And in Leiden, where Snell lived, they've recently celebrated the sci scientific history of Leiden by drawing famous equations and diagrams on the sides of buildings. But we don't really get rays by themselves. What we have is we have a light beam is a family of rays, or sometimes called a bundle of rays. And here, through a lens, which has been carefully designed to control the refraction, the angle at each, at each of these, uh, uh, at each of, where each of these rays comes in, we get that all of these parallel lines all converge to focus. And that's the basic sort of fact of image making, and of course it requires a lot of engineering to design and deliver a lens of the quality to get all of the rays to come together at a single point, but that is the basic idea behind spectacles, telescopes, and microscopes. Interestingly, that doesn't always have to happen, of course. If you've got a curve that doesn't have this special design, the light rays all come together, not at a single point focus, but typically in two dimensions on a line, a bright line, which meets in this case at a point called a caustic. And the first investigation of caustics that we know of is actually Leonardo da Vinci about 100 years earlier. Um, and I'm sure everybody's seen this so-called coffee cup caustic coming from the parallel lines coming in and reflecting on the surface of the coffee. And that's a mathematical curve called a nephroid curve. It also happens for random, if you have a random surface, like the surface of water, you get this random focusing that we all are familiar with on the bottom of a swimming pool. But interestingly, mathema the mathematics behind these caustics was only understood fully in the 1970s um, as an application of the area known as catastrophe theory. So why should rays behave the way they do? And that's obviously what we try to do in science, is try to say if we have a lot of empirical observations, why do they behave the way they do? And a remarkable um, sort of, as I say, theory, it's a proposal, it didn't necessarily have an explanation for these behavior of the ray of light, came from Fermat, the same person who had a last theorem. This was at a different period of his life, where I'm paraphrasing light rays, often we say to students, choose the path which makes the time of flight between the endpoints stationary. So if the light ray starts here and finishes here, a straight line is going to be, assuming it goes equally fast, a straight line is going to minimize the time. It's minimal time, not minimal distance, and Snell's law, where you've got the refractive index changing the speed of the wave, is, it wouldn't be true if it was minimum distance. So. It's mysterious, but it explains the observations. Without Snell's law, uh, so, so, yeah, so um, without Snell's law, it could have been stationary distance. What this does is it requires light to travel at a finite speed. It's not 
propagating instantaneously. And actually, first serious measurement of the speed of light was Roma a few years afterwards. Um, and that got refined over the following centuries. But from a sort of more philosophical question, if we're going to say rays have the ability to choose, how does a ray know where it's going to end up in order to choose that minimal path? So mathematically, you can set it up as a boundary value problem, but that doesn't necessarily mean that light knows how to work. And it's actually not even that practical. Hamilton, who um, you might be familiar with is both in Hamiltonian optics and Hamiltonian mechanics, developed his theory of Hamiltonian uh, mechanics precisely because he was very frustrated in doing experiments, shining light into crystals. He didn't know where the path was because he didn't know where to look for the light coming out because he didn't know where it came out. So he formulated effectively Fermat's principle in a different way that's based on initial conditions rather than boundary conditions. And so this leads to a sort of fundamental duality in the idea of what we have re rays and underlying it waves. What is a ray? So in this Fermat principle, and supported by Newton, he'd say it's the path of a light corpuscle. So of course, we have this question that goes on for centuries, is light a particle, is light a wave? And this principle was used as an evidence um, to, to argue that it's a particle. If it's a wave, we still have to explain somehow what it is. In our modern theory, we can derive Fermat's principle purely from the wave theory, because what we can interpret is rays are a particularly coherent path in the superposition of waves. Technically, it, they're saddle points in a diffraction integral, if you know what that means. Otherwise, don't worry or ask Tom in the break. Um, but this, is, but this is at the heart of the semi-classical analogy between classical and quantum mechanics as well, for example, as picked up by Richard Feynman in his, say, his book QED, and used as the fundamental insight into the interaction, quantum interaction, of light and matter. Okay, so that's rays. Now, what about mechanical effects? So... As we can say now, as we would always think in modern physics, if something exists in physics, it should carry both energy and momentum. And if we think of light beams as particles, that's natural for a corpuscular theory. But it is possible to frame wave theories in terms of waves carry um, energy and momentum. But the actual connection of that, the idea of wave mechanics, was only properly developed with quantum theory in the, in the 20th century. So, so, that was a, so there was a bit of a conflict. If you're going to use energy and momentum of light, you're sort of in, inferring um, that the, it probably has a particle nature. So Kepler um, talked about the mechanical effect of light uh, to explain the observation that a comet tail is always pointing away from the sun. He says that there's a solar wind of, of light particles that's always pushing the comet tail away from the sun. And so that's, yeah, the early 1600s. Descartes, a few decades afterwards, explains, and it's true, although Descartes made a bit of a mistake in his, his explanation, that Snell's law is actually a manifestation of momentum conservation of light. A little known fact, but actually quite important, is that, of course, if light is a particle, it should be affected by a gravitational field. And that was observed by Soldner in 1802. It's just that that was also the year that Thomas Young demonstrated, as we'll get to, that light is a wave. And so waves were seen as different from particles. So it's completely forgotten that even in the classical world, gravitational deflection, light rays should be diffracted by gravity. And it was seen as something that was a qualitatively new prediction by Einstein for general relativity, although actually it's becomes just a quantitative, um, and Einstein's calculation actually in involves both the Soldner part and then a time dilation part coming from special relativity. Following on a little bit later on, circularly polarized light, um, obviously is light where we, we get to polarization uh, presently, 
But it, if it rotates around, uh, pointing, I've got to mention him because he was the first professor in Birmingham, um, observed that this should be, have an angular momentum that should be able to be transferred to matter. And although he couldn't quite do the experiment, this is routinely done now um, via the idea of optical tweezers that was developed by Arthur Ashkin in the 1980s and got the Nobel Prize for Physics um, a couple of years ago, or shared in it. And in fact, I'm en route to um, a big international meeting in Finland, uh, which is on purely the angular effects of light. So the optical angular, so the optical angular momentum, and and so this is a major field in modern optics now that that you can actually use light. Not necessarily here. I picked drawn a picture of a solar sail. Um, that could be true as well, but actually to pick up and, and manipulate small particles such as biological particles, light is actually a lot better to do than any to use than any other form of mechanical device. So that's mechanic. Okay, so mechanical effects. They're visible when so they're visible. They're visible when light interacts with matter, like reflection and refraction. And of course, historically, we can't think about mechanical effects without asking what is the material that light's propagating through. Famously and confusingly, people talked about the ether, in particular Newton, as this hypothetical material that light um, propagates through even in a vacuum. And in a sense, over the centuries, ether physics became a wackier and wackier subject as everything that was unexplained to do with light became a mechanical property of this mysterious ether. And here's um, a quote from Lorentz, 1916, so well into what we would think of as the sort of 20th century. I cannot but regard the ether, which can be the seat of an electromagnetic field with its energy and vibrations, as endowed with a certain degree of substantiality. So even then he believes in the ether, however different it may be from all ordinary matter. So moving on to waves, um, and again, in antiquity, um, but through to Galileo, 1610, people were very familiar with the idea of waves in sound. Pythagoras himself talks about sound as a vibration and as a wave. And so that's a sort of reference when people are thinking about light, is light a wave? They're sort of comparing it to sound. So in 1665, Grimaldi did a various experiments where he noted at the edges of shadows, you see fringes like this. Of course, it's easy to see this with a coherent light source like a laser, um, far harder if you're doing it with sunlight or candles like these guys. Gregory in Scotland, 1675, used a bird feather as what we might now see as a diffraction grating and saw an interference pattern, although there's no pi I couldn't find a picture. But importantly, Hawkins in 1678 proposed a full wave theory of light where the secondary waves start on wavefronts of primary waves and you add the waves together. It, it was, it's not incredibly quantitative, but it was, did a good job at um, qualitatively describing a lot of patterns. And Fresnel in 1818 picked up this and came up with a formal mathematically rigorous theory that we now recognize as the, the formal diffraction theory that agrees with um, all observations. But that wasn't seen as compelling. Newton himself talks about light as a corpuscle and has some explanation of why Grimaldi sees his fringes. And somehow it wasn't until, as I say, Thomas Young, 1801, who demonstrated interference from two point sources. Now, people always talk about Young slits. Young didn't actually have slits. What he had was a very thin sheet of card, but actually using a laser and a, on one of my hairs, I think I should be able to demonstrate it to you. And if you, I can't do it, no, it's not, the screen's not quite right here, but if you come to me in the break, I can show you. It's very easy to see a Young type slits just by looking at a laser beam diffracting around um, a human hair. So this led to everybody overnight suddenly accepted the wave theory. And that was Young's later on more careful sketch of interference. Um, this is a um, calculation I made analogous to that, including the direction 
of the wave itself, the local, the local propagation direction, which would be what Newton would have said is the flow of the corpuscles. And interestingly, just 10 years ago, the group of Ephraim Steinberg in Toronto actually plotted exactly, or measured ex ex explicitly, these arrows as photon paths. So somehow, the idea of photons as particles coming back to, to, can be used to explain this young diffraction pattern as well, that waves and particles really are dual. But now we've got waves everywhere, from quantum mechanics to gravity, and here's James Jeans, 1930, tendency of modern physics is to resolve the whole material universe into waves, and nothing but waves. Waves are of two kinds, bottled up waves, which we call matter, and unbottled waves, which we call radiation and light. We can reduce the whole universe to a world of light, potential or existence. The whole story of creation can be told with perfect accuracy and completeness with six words, God said, let there be light. Now, I don't quite agree with that. It's not quite right, but I'm not going to say any more about light waves. Instead, moving on to colour, and Newton had his prism experiment, of course, which separates out the colours, refuting Aristotle that said the only true colour is white, Newton's proving that, that white is made up of these colours, but these colours aren't necessarily made up of other colours. Of course, that's spectral colours, and we have a slightly more complicated story with colour mixtures that I'm not going to go into too much. It's also interesting to observe, going back to the analogy between light and um, sound, although Newton didn't think that light was a wave, unlike sound, his definition of the colour spectrum, or the colour hues, are red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, was inspired by the um, major scale. So red to orange, or orange to yellow. He, so red to orange is a tone, orange to yellow is a semitone, and that's why orange and indigo, or sorry, or orange and indigo, which often don't seem to quite fit in, are there because he deliberately included them as semitones rather than tones. So he said colour mixtures, but later on people realised that this isn't the full story. And of course it's also interesting that in our eyes we join together red and violet on the colour circle, but actually on the spectrum we go off on each side. And Emily de Chatelet in 1737, um, in I think the first publication for the um, Paris um, Academy written by a woman proposed that actually there's light beyond red, infrared, which she calls heat rays. So identifying the sort of the spectrum was wider than just the visible spectrum. So colour, again it's Thomas Young and picked up by Hermann Helmholtz. Colour is all to do with, what we see as colour is all to do with our eyes. So this is Helmholtz's um, picture, it's a modern picture, really this is the sensitivity of the three types of cones in our eyes. And again, you can see the red and the green cone very close to each other, and that's again because it was a mutation in relatively late in the development of, between monkeys and apes in our timeline that actually separated these two, so it's not very strongly separated. So when we put it together in the physiology, we turn the spectrum into the circle, and this is the technical gamut of saturated colours. If you're playing on your computer, you'll be more used to thinking about the RGB colour cube, where you can change the amount of red, green, and blue, um, red, green, and blue, which are related to these three peaks here, or magenta, cyan, and yellow, if you're thinking about inks for your printer, because one's writing on white, one's writing on black. And if we look down the axis of the colour cube, you can see that we recover the, oops, we, re, we, we recover the, um, the colour circle here, red, yellow, green, um, cyan, blue, and magenta, just on there with the white in the middle with all the colours. Rainbow is putting together these ideas. Descartes, 1637, this is his picture. He gets most of the rainbow as an explanation with what he, with what he um, described before. 
Um, it's, it's to do with reflection and refraction in a raindrop. In fact, the, ra the, the rainbow itself is a caustic. As you take the rays going up, the ones going out, they go down and then back. So that caustic is, that what you, is, is, is actually what you see. It's slightly different for different colors, of course. But you also get, if you do it with the wave theory of light, as explored by Arian Stokes in the 1860s, some fringes underneath the main bow, which come from actually the diffraction, um, um, diffraction theory of, of, of caustics. And just relatively recently, in 1990, um, using um, photometry, um, people were able to actually ask, measure, what are all the colors of the rainbow? So this is measure of the rainbow, and here's our color gamut. You can see, actually, it's really only a very tiny bit of color space that the measurements of the rainbow actually um, give it. It's just we see all these different colors because all those colors in a very desaturated form um, occur very close to white. So I'm almost out of time, and I don't have time to tell you about polarization. I just want to very quickly say it was, again, discovered in a chunk of crystal called Iceland Spa, and suddenly no one's got any explanation for why do you suddenly see, when you look through it, two images of what's behind rather than one. And Newton has an explanation. Have not the rays of light several sides endowed with several original properties? So that's from the ray theory, or the corpuscle theory. Hawkins also has a very detailed complicated um, explanation um, based on the geometry of ellipsoids, but also accounts for it. I'm not going to be able to talk about it. I just want to show you one very particular thing. So obviously, we've got polarizers. The main thing in natural light is light could be fully polarized, unpolarized, where you don't see any difference, or partially polarized. And different sorts of things are are polarized in different ways. And obviously, we have polaroid shades to reduce the glare from the partial polarization coming from reflection. But what I want to finish with is the idea of what about the blue sky. Everybody who's ever lived probably has seen the blue sky. It's blue. I didn't talk about that. Rayleigh explained why to do with Rayleigh scattering. But it's also polarized. Here's me. Well, demonstrating it with a polarizer, you can see as I rotate the polarizer in the same patch of sky, it goes darker and brighter. And I tried to fix where I thought it was darkest, um, and the line is what allows, where the allows, so that that's the polarization, dominant polarization direction there. And as it happens, the direction of the sun was off in that direction. Now, this isn't new, in fact, Von Frisch, who got the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine in 1973, realized bees see this polarization pattern. And I'll show you, if you come to me in the break, I'll show you this beautiful quotation. Once again, bees appear to us miraculous. It is now clear ants, other insects, crayfish, spiders, all perceive polarized light and use it for orientation. Amongst all these, the human being is the unendowed one. Physiology of our eyes. Nevertheless, working with some colleagues a few years ago, we measured the skylight polarization pattern. And this is the full sky. So angle from the zenith is radius here. There's the sun. And you can see that there's this funny sort of ping fingerprint pattern here, which is what we would call, well, what people in modern physics would call a half vortex. I think it still looks a bit like a fingerprint. But it's, uh, it's, it's a bit like the optic axis of a crystal. And historically, these were discovered by people like Fresnel, Arago, and Brewster in the 1800s. But no one actually plotted the polarization pattern. So David Brewster said, it is not one of the least wonders of terrestrial physics that the blue atmosphere which overhangs us exhibits in the light which it polarizes phenomena somewhat analogous to those of crystals with two axes of double refraction. But I want to just leave you with this picture. If our eyes had seen, evolved to see polarization, we would see this fingerprint pattern whenever the sky is blue. 
There would be mythology about it. There would be love songs about it. There would be poetry about it. But it wasn't until, until well, 20 years ago that we actually went out and measured it to see what it really looks like. So, again, just to show that, you know, there can always be features of the classical world or beyond the classical world out there if you know how to look. So, we've seen various theories and approaches made to explain the empirical qualities of classical light rooted in the 1600s. These were my themes, but that was just me. Interwoven with the physiology of vision and imaging technologies, anticipations of contemporary optical science and beyond. Sorry for overrunning and thank you for listening. Without further ado, questions uh, to Mark. Uh, we will try and keep to timing so that we don't eat into our next speaker's uh, presentation time. So if you could just raise your hands if you would like to ask a question, uh, and then uh, we will try and get the microphone to you. Uh, yes, over there at the top right-hand corner. Could you just... Are you... Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I was a bit confused. Thanks uh, for a whistle-stop tour, by the way. Amazing. Um, I was a bit confused by that um, theory um, about, you know, the, the light knowing where it was going to end up, and you said that it's trying to maintain something constant. Could you just elucidate so, okay, that? Okay, so, right, so what this, so this was, so what it is, is a proposed as a, let's say, as a mathematical explanation for how, why light behaves the way it does. So you can say that if the light starts, so think about reflection, right? Reflection from a mirror. So if I have light that I know it starts here, and I, I know it's going to finish up here, and I say it's going to go in a straight line but bounce off the mirror, which path does it take? So we know that angle of incidence equals angle of reflection, even if those two points are at different heights. And that angle of incidence equals angle of reflection follows from the assumption that that's actually the shortest path or the path that takes the least time. Mm -hmm. Similarly with the Snell's law, with this path and the sign of the angles and so forth, it's, it follows from this assertion that it's the path that takes the least time. Now obviously this isn't a theory that explains why it is, but it's a sort of, it's a principle that is consistent with the observations. So it's a bit like Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Kepler's laws of planetary motion says that the, the, the planets follow ellipses. It doesn't explain why. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, there's one at the front, and I'm just trying to... And somebody on the left. So shall we take them two one the and two just to minimise the, uh, the time lost in moving the microphone? Thank you for a fascinating uh, presentation, uh, especially the way uh, you categorize those five uh, uh, topics, uh, interesting. Would you agree that uh, uh, when you presented uh, so many uh, historic research, some of them were uh, uh, really unselected and uh, some of them started uh, acting as cumulative science. Uh, would you say that it is therefore evidence uh, coming out of them that acts as the criterion for selecting science rather than our consensual approach. Well, I think, so I think it's, I mean, okay, so I think it's a complicated question to answer, but I think what we can certainly see from certainly our modern perspective, and I was very much not trying to present anything other than with a whole, whole amount of hindsight, is that certain certain observations, as I say, like Thomas Young, overnight, this debate that had late raised for more than two centuries suddenly was immediately put to bed, so much that no one investigated gravitational diffraction of light. But other things can go relatively unnoticed, even in relatively famous books like, um, like Newton's optics, that there are features of Newton's optics that were not picked up until quite a number of years later that, again, would have resolved things.
Thank you. Hello, Mark. Well, uh, since you embarrassed me twice during your talk, I'm going to have a go at getting my own back even before the end. So, um, but bravo for doing such a good job of trying to get the history right of, you know, Emmy du Châtelet, you know, rather than William Herschel, for example. Um, but just to finish the, 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 the precedent story, Snell's Law. Um, yeah. We now know this is Ibn Zal, right? In, right, right, in, right. In, okay, so in, in no, no, sorry, I was, I was just fitting so, it into my Eurocentric um, Yeah, I mean, story, so there's this gorgeous yeah, trigonometric diagram before the end of the first millennium from Baghdad. Of but in, in light of the previous question, it, what doesn't seem to have been that familiar in Europe? So, so Kepler himself, he has, um, he has a correspondence with Harriet in England about about it, but he doesn't, he doesn't put it into his book, and, it, and that's... Right, no, and Harriet, but I like Harriet's annoyingly published nothing until yeah, far too yeah. late, silly man. Um, so, uh, but no, one that, the, the, um, the one thing you said that I felt really raised my eyebrow, because I'm pretty, is, is the, all the colours of the rainbow statement. Because you seem to suggest that the rainbow colours were in one tiny bit of the colour gamut, but so they really aren't. So these are the, so the, okay, so all I'm saying, so these were, so, I mean, I've, these aren't my measurements, but I've discussed this with the person who made the measurements. So he has, I mean, he's, he's been making these measurements over um, 30 years of using detailed photometry, looking what part of the colour gamut the measured, what on the sort of, from his own measurements. And from his own measurements, although the, the range of colours does change, it is quite narrowly focused around the... Well, just for, for one thing, there's no such thing as the colours of a rainbow. There are a whole... There's a no, three no, sure. parameter set of rainbows. Sure, absolutely. So what he okay. has is that he has a... So in his measurements, he has a patch of the colour gamut that is corresponds to his patch of his photographs. Okay, cool. I can show you the paper. I'll pop something in, in the end. Final little question. Human detection of polarised light. What's your view on Heidegger's brush? I think... It, so I've discussed this with biologists. Um, Heidegger's brush would appear to be a physiological anomaly due to the way that the uh, different sorts of cones are packed in the, in the retina. So, it's so you not, don't think it's a detection of polarisation? Well, it detects polarisation, but I think it's an accident rather than a, 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 a relic of something that we evolved to see in the past. But I've discussed it with biologists. If you could just pass it on to your neighbour, thank you. And then after we'll this question, we'll probably have time for this one more. The polarisation. Uh, thanks for the beautiful picture of the polarisation of the atmosphere. I was just wondering, do we know what's causing it? Is it the gas or is it water? Yeah, so, or? Sorry, I, because I'm talking about history, I don't have time to talk about physics. Yeah. yeah, so it's purely explained by Rayleigh scattering. So the person who... So, so as the... So, so what we have, what, what causes the blue in the atmosphere is light coming from the sun and it scatters multiple times bouncing off different air molecules. If it was just, if it went straight through, we would see just the sun and nothing else. If it bounced once, ah, so the point is the polarization tends to favor the direction perpendicular to the plane of scattering. So if, if the scattering is in the horizontal plane, it will tend to get more vertically polarized. So that would mean if it just scatter, bounced once that you get concentric circles around the sun. Okay. But the symmetry is broken. There's a lot more atmosphere to the sides yeah. than there is this way. This is about eight kilometers deep. This is about 300 kilometers deep. So there's a lot more secondary scattering. So net in the direction of the sun, it's vertical. So mathematically, and it's beautiful, you do a perturbation theory, the circles get perturbed into confocal ellipses. Okay, and thanks. you're looking at the focus yeah. of the Well, ellipse. I was just wondering, so it's just the number of particles it scatters off. I was wondering, like, if, because you said a lot of creatures underwater can see polarised light, so as well. So this would be, so it's different, so different would different. be, and, and, and the, so the only thing this requires is the atmosphere to be optically thin. Yeah. So um, if it was thinner, there'd be less secondary polarization. So I've looked, but NASA never did it, is make a measurement of the skylight polarization on Mars. But what we'd expect to see would be the, the it's far closer to the um, concentric right. circles than um, confocal ellipses. And, but just to say, one of the things that people who, uh, who, who do atmospheric measurements, like to say my colleague Raymond Lee, who, who made the, um, the rainbow measurements as well, um, they, the dependence of the, the, sep the sort of particular 
distance from the sun of these points is dependent on the number of, um, of pollutants in the atmosphere. So they actually do use this polarization pattern as a very a, a quick way of, of estimating pollutants, um, for example. Right, we've got time for one final question back on the left. Ah. Ah, so, good question. In modern optics, absolutely. So, the first point to say is really like follows, it follows the path which makes the um, time the least. If we're in curved space, then obviously it's not necessarily going to be a straight line. And in fact, in the last 20 years, uh, people have realized that you can engineer materials, metamaterials, through something called transformation optics where you can fool the light passing through a material into thinking that space is curved. This was the basis, for example, of invisibility cloaks that were um, in the news about 15 years ago and continue to be an area of um, intense technological development. Right. Well, thank you very much. Um... Thank you very much, Mark, for uh, this brilliant introduction to the rest of the proceedings uh, for the day, giving us uh, such a concise but, but quite wide introduction to a range of topics that will interest us uh, both this morning and this afternoon.